Continuing our discussion on the liver, the project manager. In our first discussion, we had a look at what the liver does with the food that we're eating. We also did an assessment on food and, and how the body uses different foods in slightly different ways. Now we're going to have a look at what the liver does with what's coming out of your body. And all of us, it's inevitable living on planet Earth today, have environmental poisons in our body. But I thank God that he has given us the liver that is able to manage and deal with them. At Misty Mountain Health Retreat, our guests come in on Sunday, they have a lunch on Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, they do a fast. And this is uh, mostly vegetable with a little bit of fruit juices, um, every couple of hours and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to describe to you what happens when a person goes on a fast. So when a person goes on a fast, even though we're giving them fresh vegetables with a little fruit every two hours, so they have five a day, they have eight, ten, twelve, two and four and then at six o'clock at night we serve a broth and I did talk about the broth and the sticky nettle in the broth. So we're giving them a lot of nourishment. In fact, we say to our guests, you couldn't eat in a day what we put into your juices. So it's high nourishment. But it's still not enough. And so what happens is the liver starts breaking down the fat stores. Starts breaking down the fat stores to give the glucose that the body needs to run on. But do you remember what I said in the first lecture, what's stored in the fat stores? Mm -hmm. Environmental poisons. And that's why when someone goes on a fast, often their breath is not very nice, their body odour can be a little strong, what they're leaving in the toilet can be very strong because their body's starting to break down those fat stores. And those fat stores that release the environmental poisons are in a fat soluble state. So most poisons are in a fat soluble, fat soluble state. And the body cannot release it as a fat soluble toxin. The liver has to break it down into a water soluble state. And as a water soluble state, it can be easily urinated out, sweated out, come out via the colon. So what I'm going to describe to you now is the three phases of the liver detox. This information has only been known since about 2010. So phase one basically begins probably within about 24 hours of, of, uh, of no food entering the stomach. So we give our guests their main meal at 1.30. So by midday the next day, which is Monday in our retreat, phase one kicks in. In phase one of the liver detox, the liver takes this fat soluble toxin. The fat soluble toxin could be a variety of things, but remember it's fairly toxic because the liver has stored it in fat. So the liver takes this fat soluble toxin and it breaks it down to a metabolite. A metabolite simply means the first stage of metabolism or the first stage of breakdown. But this metabolite is quite toxic. This metabolite can be a hundred times more toxic than it originally was. That is definitely so with alcohol. This metabolite creates a lot of free radicals. And free radicals are damaging to the tissues. It's also, also highly volatile. Because of this, your liver has certain needs. So let's discuss the needs that your liver has at this stage. Because this is quite toxic, this metabolite. So the liver needs antioxidants. What's an antioxidant? Antioxidants are very high in electrons 
And a free radical is basically an atom missing an electron. And when an atom is, is missing an electron, it grabs an electron from the next atom. And then that atom grabs one from this. So you've got this chain of free radical action that can be damaging to the tissues. But God in his wisdom and mercy gave us plants that have lots of electrons on it. They're called antioxidants. And the plants that have the highest antioxidants, in fact, one antioxidant is called beta carotene. So beta carotene, the plants that it's found in is your dark green and your dark orange vegetables. So the, the majority of juices that we give our guests are 80% carrot, 10% apple and 10% celery. And our celery is very green, like your celery out in the garden. <laughs> dark green. 80% carrot, 10% apple, it's usually the Granny Smith, and 10% celery. We have to be careful we don't put too much celery in our juices because our celery is so strong. Do you use the leaves in the... Yes, yes, yes. We, leave, we use the leaves more than the stems. So that juice is very, very high in beta carotenes. We also give our guests a shot of green barley every second juice. That's very high in beta carotenes. Most of our juices that we give our guests are either green or orange or red. So your beets, your beets are high in the beta carotenes. So your beta carotene is one of the most <coughs> famous antioxidants. Vitamin C is also very famous. The vitamin C should be the whole C. What do I mean by that? Not just ascorbic acid. Taking ascorbic acid is like getting an envelope in the mail that's empty. When you find ascorbic acid in nature, you'll find it with bioflavonoids. So when you use vitamin C, it should be ascorbic acid with bioflavonoids. So that's your whole C. You've heard of Linnaeus Pauling. He became very famous on his work on vitamin C. It was always the whole C. How do you give that vitamin C? Is it like a tablet? Or is it it's in a powder and we usually mix it in with the green barley. Okay. Yes. What can we do when we don't get to the tablets or powders, but only from the nature? Well, you can get it in nature. In fact, the homegrown vegetables certainly do have it. But on a detox, we, we try and give a higher dose going through the detox. How much do you use? Is it one teaspoon and... Well, actually half a teaspoon, well, maybe a thousand milligrams twice a day, something like that. That's of the whole C. And vitamin E is also a beta, um, an antioxidant like beta carotene and vitamin C. These are the three most famous antioxidants. Vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin. The way you remember your fat soluble vitamins is ADEK, A-D-E-K. A-D-E-K are your fat soluble vitamins. And with our guests, every second juice, we give them a little protein powder in a little soy or almond milk with a bit of coconut cream. So in the almond milk and in the coconut cream, they're getting vitamin E. That will, that you will understand that as we go through this. Now minerals are also necessary in stage one and so is vitamin B, but they are not antioxidants. So I'm, driving, I'm drawing them sideways. So where are the guests getting the minerals? We, we suggest and encourage our guests to have a little Celtic salt before every glass of water. The broth that they're having at night is incredibly high in minerals, especially if you put stinging nettle in there. So they're getting their minerals there. And if you can put your homegrown celery in, very, very high in minerals. So that's where the minerals are happening. And we also do a liquid vitamin B. When you buy the vitamin B, ideally you buy the methylated vitamin B, that your body can utilise that. 
better. Within 36 hours of starting a detox, phase two kicks in. So for our guests that arrive uh, Sunday, have a Sunday lunch, and who are fasting Monday, Tuesday, certainly by Tuesday morning, phase two has kicked in. And remember, the purpose of these phases is to bring the fat-soluble toxin to a water-soluble state. In phase two, the liver takes this highly volatile, highly toxic metabolite and joins it together with amino acids. The union of the toxic metabolite with the amino acids, like a joining together, the medical term is conjugate, a joining together, that produces the water-soluble state. So we looked at what phase one needs, which is antioxidants, beta carotene, vitamin C, vitamin E. Also helps to have the minerals and the vitamin B. So what does phase two need? Phase two needs protein. Because protein supplies the amino acids to mop up the toxic metabolites <laughs> to produce the water soluble state. How many people take protein on a fast. They don't, do they? And then they get sick and their therapist tells them they're going through a healing crisis. They're not going through a healing crisis, they're going through a liver crisis. Because if you don't supply the protein within 48 hours of starting a detox, if you don't supply some protein, that person can suffer 25% liver function loss. What happens is the liver starts to break down to supply the protein needed. Well, this is important. A guest said to me, ah, this explains. I went on a 10-day water fast with a doctor in Sydney. She said within... 36 hours, I started vomiting and diarrhea. And all the therapists said, ah, you're going through a healing crisis. This is good. She was so sick. So sick. Yeah. So you never recommend the only water bath? No, we don't. Can you see why? Because as you're revealing the fat-soluble toxins in students, we have more fat-soluble toxins today than ever. A hundred years ago, there were, there were a few writers advocating long fasts. Well, a hundred years ago, we weren't dealing with these. You see that? So if one fasts within a day or two, they have to have these proteins. If you did a day's fast, you could probably get away without it. I tell our guests this, and I think it's a very important statement. We nutritionally support your liver to effectively detoxify you. We nutritionally support. Now, if we have the Vietnam vet do our program, do you know what I do? I give him a protein drink every juice. <laughs> Because mm -hmm. the more, the more fat-soluble toxins, the more metabolites, the more amino acids he needs. And what we do is we buy a pea protein made out of pea, legume, pea protein, and we put it with almond milk or soy milk and a little coconut cream and a drop of stevia which gives it a tiny little bit of a sweet. And when the guests drink it, they go, oh, this one's nice, compared to the green barley. 
I say, have your greens, then have your nice juice. <laughs> <laughs> so on Monday, we give them green barley at 8, 12 and 4. Protein at 10 and 2. Whereas on Tuesday, we'd swip it, we flip it around because on Tuesday, they've gone on to phase two of the liver detox. So we give the protein supplement with the juice at 8, 12 and 4, and then the green barley at 10 and 2. And I usually give this lecture on Tuesday morning as they start to go through the three phase of the liver detox. When I did my nutrition course, which was about 14 years ago, every single module we studied the three phase of the liver detox. As I was lecturing in America one year, a man came up and he said, that's very interesting, but he said, this is not for your lay people, this is for your academics. I said, lay people also have livers. <laughs> <laughs> Now let's have a look at the three essential food groups. What are the three essential food groups? Fibre. Fibre contains all these antioxidants in our vegetables. Protein. Protein is essential for phase two of the liver detox. Fat. We need the fat for our vitamin E and phase three. <coughs> phase three of the liver detox is happening in conjunction with phase two. And in phase three, the liver takes the water soluble state <coughs> and it releases it out via your kidneys. It releases it out via your sweat glands. It releases out via your colon. That's why it's so important that the guests be drinking adequate water. What about exercise in this time? Absolutely. We give our guests an exercise program from 6.30 to 7.30 every day. And then at 1 o'clock every day, and next week I'll be going through the program, the structure of the program we give. We do a Pilates class, they're core strengthening exercises. Because through the lectures I'm constantly saying how important it is to strengthen the core. And those core muscles are connected with your spine. That's, and in page, I think it's page um, 29 of, of um, Councils on Diet and Food. So Council on Diet and Food, page 29. Ellen White gives one of those amazingly long sentences she does and she's referring to Daniel. She says, the erect form, the fair countenance, the undimmed senses, the untainted breath. She said, all so many certificates of good habits, insignia of the nobility with which nature honours those who are obedient to her laws. Amazing statement. I did a health school in Fiji one year. I had about 100 students. Mm -hmm. And every day we started with that sentence. And er first day we studied the erect form. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we talked much about the core. And then the next day, the fair countenance. So that's what we did for our, our, our framework. But the erect form, many people don't think erect form has to do with strong abdominal muscles. Mm -hmm. Yes, when the swine realize that they need this uh, detox liver, what happens to them, to them? When does one realize they need the detox liver? I guess it's hard to say. Anytime. Yeah, our guests come to our retreat to do the two days fast. The reason why I mention the water is because you need to be well hydrated for your kidneys to, to be able to release and you need to have the water so you've got the water in you for the, for the big sweat in the steam sauna. 
That's why the steam saunas, I, I believe it's an important part of the detox. And also having adequate water helps to keep the colon going. So this also explains why people get sick on detoxes if they don't nutritionally support their, their liver. Yeah? Is there also some literature about these three phases? Mm -hmm. Sorry, say is, that again. Is there also some liter literature about these three phases? Um, we do have some books in America that talk about, I mean, in Australia. Uh, Dr. Sandra Cabot, she's a very famous Australian doctor, but I know her books have gone worldwide. She's got a book called The Ultimate Detox, where she talks about the three phase of the liver detox. Henry Osaki, he's got a book called, um, I think, The Nutritional Elements for Physicians. He talks about the three phase of the liver detox. My book, Self Heal by Design, I, I devote a whole chapter to the project manager where I explain the three phases of the liver detox. Yes? Um, it's not <laughs> I have a question. You don't do longer uh, fasting, you just do it for two days. That's right. Mm -hmm. Can you see why? Because if we go any longer, too much fat soluble toxins can be released. And I was doing a study, which was on a study that had been done from many of the fasting experts in the world today, and they all agree that it is better to do two days every week than a 10-day fast. Mm -hmm. So that's what you do? Yeah. In the second week you do Well, the our guests will come for one or two weeks, and if they come for two weeks, they do two lots of two-day juices. We had a man come recently and he wanted to do a six-day fast. So he did. It was his choice. Yes. It was fine because we nutritionally support him. But this man, has, ah, he'd be 70 now, and he's been living like this for 40 years. So there weren't too... I don't think there'd be too many environmental poisons in him. But if someone has a lot of environmental poisons in them, that's when you need to be a bit more cautious. Yeah? Uh, some use flaxseed and psyllium husk for, for fibre when you're doing a fast. Well, you'd, you don't want any fibre because you don't want any digestion. But if you want to get the bowel movements... When we look at uh, the, the three meetings we're going to be doing on, uh, on the gut, I'll show you the teas that we use. We use, uh, we use buckthorn, cascara and licorice tea and we, we give that to our guests every night and that keeps the colon going. And that gently stimulates peristalsis. But during fasting you don't need that? They must have that through fasting. Through fasting. Yeah, because you must keep these organs of elimination open. Mm -hmm. Some people when they're on a fast their colon will keep going but I find most people when the fibre stops the colon stops. And you can see why we don't want to give them fibre because we want the, the fasting of the releasing of the fat soluble toxins from the, from the fat cells. Yeah? So your guests have no healing crisis? Not usually. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we get people with, you know, we'll have se severe headaches. Sometimes we've had people vomit. But not much, not much. Do you do enema with them? Uh, it, all, it all depends on, uh, on, on the state, you know. Some people get diarrhoea, we're not going to do an enema on them if they have a diarrhoea. But we have a colonic uh, irrigation set up at Misty Mountain, so we do do colonic irrigations. Is so the fast or the whole time they are there? Pardon? With the fast, or are you talking about the whole time they have colon irrigations? Uh, a lot of our guests choose not to have a colonic irrigation. So our guests choose, and also our health director, you know, might advise. They might have one colonic in the week, or they might have two. It it depends on the person, depends on their problem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have had we have had, get, had return guests say to us that they did the fast. They had the herbs every night to, to um, get their colon moving every day. 
and they had one colonic irrigation. It's like a bowel treatment where you've got water going in and out the whole time. So they come back a year later and they said, before they came to our retreat, they had problems with constipation, but since doing the program, their colon is, is going nicely. And they believe that the colonic irrigation helped there. Now with other people, it won't help as, as much as that, but you, you, you look at the history and look at the symptoms, you know, uh, there can be many reasons. No two people are the same. So you, you always look at that. We had a lady who had breast cancer and she chose to have five colonics a week for four weeks. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> it doesn't hurt, it's just water going in and out. You don't define, or you don't buy the idea that it disrupts the, the flora? If it was soapy water, it would. It's just water. Coffee water, then? Uh, no, no. We sometimes do a coffee enema, and what the coffee enema does, it stimulates the liver to drop waste. So a person who has a coffee enema, if you do a colonic on them, you can see the, their bile, bile coming through. But not everyone chooses that, not everyone wants that, so we, we certainly go with uh, what the person desires and what they want. Can you measure uh, to what extent uh, the liver functions? Uh, no. No? No, we can't really measure it, but often the symptoms will tell you. You know, severe liver problem is when the urine goes a bit dark and the, and the stools are almost light like clay. That's severe liver problems. <coughs> but most people that don't have them that severe um, come back a little bit so it's not quite as severe. They get very nauseous, especially when they have any fats. So there are some herbs that you can give people to boost liver function. So let's have a look at the herbs. And remember Psalm 104 verse 14, where the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. And you've probably heard the saying, bitter to the mouth, sweet to the stomach, sweet to the mouth, bitter to the stomach. You can also apply that to liver. Sweet to the mouth, bitter to the liver. Bitter to the mouth, sweet to the liver. So all your bitter herbs are great for the liver. So this is dandelion. And that can be the flower or the stem or the leaf or the root. It all has those bitter properties. Gentian. Gentian's a very bitter herb. Uh, it's a root and St. Mary's thistle and sometimes that's called milk thistle. So we have, uh, we have a herb company in Australia, it's called Mediherb and it's a practitioner only one but you can get tablets herbal tablets and they have one herbal tablet that has all these herbs in it and if we get someone that's got liver pain, uh, gall pain, we get them to suck on those bitter herbs. Very bitter but it, it, uh, it seems to bring relief. Should they not swallow their tablet? Well if they suck it they'll access it, access it quicker. That bitter in the mouth. They don't like it, but when they get the relief, they like it. <laughs> yeah. Is it the same when drinking, for example, dandelion juice? Some bitter herbs. As yeah. Juice? Yes. Yes. Dandelion juice is very bitter. Yeah. That's no, why. Would it happen the same way? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. That's why I uh, St. Mary's thistle is the seed, gentian is a root, and dandelion is usually the root. If you made a tea out of that, it's very hard to drink because it's so bitter. <laughs> yeah? Maybe you mentioned it, but, but I didn't hear it. But the, the needs for phase three, that is fats. Yeah, well. The, yeah, the phase three, its needs aren't as great as these ones because once that water-soluble to toxin's there, mm -hmm. 
it basically flows out. But the beauty of the fats is it keeps the membrane supple. Mm -hmm. What about artichoke? Yes, artichoke. Artichoke's a, uh, a good one. Now I want to cover something here that has to do with the liver. And it's an important point because there are so many misconceptions about this subject. The liver is the organ that makes cholesterol. And we've been told that cholesterol is public enemy number one. Am I right? Mm -hmm. We've been told that cholesterol causes heart disease. Is that right? Mm -hmm. But Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, in his book, The Great Cholesterol Con, he's a cardiovascular surgeon, he says there is no proof that cholesterol causes heart disease. Isn't that incredible? The great deceiver's been at it again. So what I want to do is I want to explain what cholesterol is. 80% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from glucose. And 20% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from fat. And the liver makes cholesterol according to the body's demands. The two main cholesterols are high-density lipoprotein and low-density lipoprotein. Mm -hmm. And we've been told that high-density lipoprotein is the good cholesterol and low-density lipoprotein is the bad. Yep. But the body doesn't make bad things. <laughs> it has a role. So the reason why high-density lipoprotein is being called the good cholesterol is because it is the carrier and it is the carrier of excess cholesterol back to the liver. Whereas LDL, its role in the body is that of a repairer and a rebuilder. So where are you going to find it, students? Wherever there's a need for repair and rebuilding. Can you see that? But LDL does something else. LDL delivers cholesterol to the brain. And the brain loves cholesterol. Let me show you why. Your brain cells are consuming 15 times the fuel of any other cell, and they can, because they're headquarters. But glucose burns at 4 calories per gram. Whereas fat, it burns at nine calories per gram. Can you see why the brain loves fat? Because it's going to get more than twice the units of energy that glucose will give. Yes? So the brain, does it both use uh, HDL and LDL cholesterol? Just LDL. Just LDL, So let me show you how these two cholesterols work together. In the blood. So we're going to have a look at the blood vessel and see how it works. So here's the blood vessel. And because of its low density, LDL is always on the edge. Because of its high density, HDL is in the middle. In her book, Who Switched Off My Brain, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, she spends the first three chapters looking at all the environmental poisons that damage the endothelium cells that line the arteries. So environmental poisons, they're coming at us from every side. They're in our laundry detergent. If you can't find a biograde, Degradable laundry detergent use sodium bicarbonate. That's cheap. That's easy. Isn't it? So for what do you use it now? For washing the clothes. Uh, for just for the detergent. Mm -hmm. We had a man do our program who had orange curly hair, lots of it. Big orange beard. 
He said, I use sodium bicarbonate for everything. I wash my hair, I wash my beard, I wash my clothes, I wash my body with sodium bicarbonate. Yeah. Wash my teeth with sodium bicarbonate. Do you know in the old days, they'd go down to the river and wash their clothes. Do you know what they wash their clothes with? Water. Mm -hmm. They'd scrub it and beat it and scrub it, put it on the line, beautiful white clothes, smelling beautiful. The sun has purified it. We seem to have this mentality. We've got to scrub and clean everything with all this foam. It's all chemicals. And when we wear those clothes, there's residue of those chemicals in those clothes and, and our skin takes it in. These environmental poisons are coming from everywhere. What you're putting on your skin, your clothes, the fabrics that your clothes are made from. The polyesters, the acrylics and the nylons. Those little chemicals are coming in, they get into the blood and they damage the arterial wall. Chemicals on the food, chemicals in the air. They're everywhere, they're everywhere. Uh, mercury fillings, the mercury. Mold in the house, it can damage, it can damage. So what's going to plug up the whole student? LDL. LDL. It's plugging up the holes. But the problem is the people don't realise what the laundering detergent's doing to them. They don't realise that their potatoes have been grown with Roundup. They don't realise these things because there is a great deceiver out there who's deceiving the whole world. And so what's happening is the damage continues. What's happening in the artery? High blood pressure. What's happening is the arteries are getting clogged. Something else is happening. There are little protein molecules floating through our blood. And on this high carbohydrate diet, releasing high glucose into the blood, this high glucose grabs onto the protein molecules and becomes sticky and stick, along the, stick on the wall. And from now, now and then they move and, oh dear, stuck. That's the number one cause of a stroke and it's the number one cause of heart disease. So can you see that someone can have a, have a, have a heart attack who's a vegetarian on a high carbohydrate diet who's using lots of chemicals to wash their clothes and wash their dishes and wash their car and wash their hair. And, uh, and one says, how could they have had a heart attack? So I didn't get the last part. How was it with the proteins? In your blood, you've got little protein molecules. And on a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet, there's too much glucose in the blood. And so what it does, it connects with the protein molecules and becomes sticky. So that's also contributing to the build-up. And they dislodge. And they dislodge and get stuck. So that's after the glucose has been stored everywhere and in the fat? Well, you've still got it in the blood, yeah. And if you've got insulin resistance on the cell, then the glucose is staying in the blood. <laughs> so no way to go. So it comes out in the urine. That's called diabetes mellitus is sweet urine. But it's got to do something with it. To blame cholesterol for heart disease is like blaming the fire trucks for the fire. It's only doing its job. Yeah? Is it also true that uh, hybridized wheat, modern wheat, can do the damage to the blood vessels that we're talking about here, because that is what, what I've heard. So why? Why would the hybridised wheat do that? Because in the hybridisation process, the starch structure was changed. And the starch structure in the hybridised wheat gets the blood sugar level up higher than sugar. So that's why the hybridised wheat does it. And how many of these are hybridised wheat? And how many of these is a combination of hybridised wheat and sugar? All your pastries, of course, sugar, but even your savoury pastries have sugar in it for the, for the yeast to grow. That's the beauty of the sourdough bread. You don't have to put any sweetening in there. Because the sourdough culture, it grows on the, on the grain, the gluten in the grain. 
It's the number one killer in the world today, heart disease. Mm -hmm. But can you say it's not one thing that's causing it? It's a whole lot of things, a whole lot of things. Yeah? Was there a special reason why the glucose glues to the protein? Be it appears that that's what excess does. In her book, uh, who's watched, who, in her book, Put Your Heart in Your Mouth, it's called, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, she mm -hmm. talks about this. At the end of this, in, at the end of my series this morning, I'll write the books that I've quoted up on the board. Mm. So, heart disease stroke is the number one killer in the world today. What are they doing to try and get those levels down? What's medicine doing? Uh, stop the fat. And stop the fat. Is that right? Stop the fat. Where did this come from? 1953, Ansel Keys in Minneapolis. He first put forward that it's saturated fat that's causing heart disease. And when he did his research, he just picked the countries that had the results he wanted. He had to eliminate the Zulus. You see, they live on blood, meat and milk. Zero heart disease. Mind you, they don't live long and they have other problems, but they don't die of heart attacks. So it can't be the fat. And he had to eliminate the French and the Norwegians that love their dairy because they're, they're high, they didn't have as high a rate of heart disease. So you can see what Ansel Keys did. He just picked the pick the countries that appeared to support <coughs> his theory. But the fact is, it's not the butter on the bread, it's the bread under the butter. It's not the olive oil on the pasta, it's the pasta under the olive oil. Yeah. Fat's been shot because of who it hangs around with. So what, what uh, the authorities have done, they've put everyone on a fat-free diet, low fat, yeah? What does God say about that? Have you ever yes. done a Bible study on olive oil in the Bible? <laughs> he used a lot of olive oil. <laughs> Especially go to the story of Elijah. And what did, the, what did God do every night in the widow's cruise? He put olive oil in it. Who put the oil there? God did. What's God saying about olive oil? No, I don't think he put a litre of olive oil in there. Just a little. It's a concentrated food. You don't need much. But you do need it, yes? But our problem nowadays is that we just eat too much of that, the same as we eat too much of the carbohydrates, so we eat too much of fat. So that's the problem. Yeah, but what fats? And I think that's just a question of moderation. But So the question is what fats? I don't know anyone that drinks half a cup of olive oil, do you? Oh, no. If, if you cook a lot with the oil, then maybe this will be well, a Well, I don't cook with oil. Yes, you and do. as you'll see in my fantastic fat lecture, uh, the oils get hurt mm -hmm. when you cook the oil. But I agree when someone's eating fried foods, when they're eating the, uh, the chips, the scallops, the fried, yeah, they, they certainly can get a lot of fats there. Mm -hmm. But that's what they're talking about, to have low fat, not that what you're talking about, because I think they can sometimes come to a misunderstanding, because low fat means not so much in the food, not so much, uh, as, as we said, uh, of the... Um, uh, how do you say it, uh, when you do the frying and stuff like that? But I also have been challenged because there are some authorities in the field that say we should not have any fat, that we should be getting all our fats from nuts and seeds. So low fat and they introduced margarine. They said stop eating butter, you've got to start eating margarine. Margarine is a plastic fat, it's an altered fat, it's a dangerous fat and the body doesn't recognise it. So with the low-fat diet and the margarine instead of butter, has that reduced heart disease? It made absolutely no difference. If anything, ra cancer rates are coming up almost equal to heart disease since the margarine has been brought in. Okay, we've got another one to reduce heart disease. Um, they've, they've lowered lowered the levels. What do I mean by that? 
I had the privilege of working with a nutritionist who was trained in university in America 40 years ago. Now, I'm not sure how your standards are, but in America, 30 years ago, 300 and under was deemed perfectly normal. They've lowered the levels. You have to be under 190 now. What would that be? And I just know American and Australian. So Australian, that would 300 would be about 7.5. 190 would be about 5. They're ridiculous levels. Is that the LDL cholesterol specifically? Or the, the whole cholesterol. So if someone rings me up or emails me from America and says, Barbara, I'm, my cholesterol levels are 250, the doctor says, I'll, if I don't have a go on the cholesterol-lowering medication, what's this based on, fear? I'm going to have a heart attack and die. I said, that's perfectly normal. 265 is perfectly normal. The Framingham Heart Studies. The, this is a little town of Framingham. The studies have been going for about 40 years, looking at 30,000 people. Some come on, some go. And they set up this study to prove that cholesterol causes heart disease, but it has not. People with low cholesterol levels are having heart attacks. But you know what it did show? People with low cholesterol levels um, are in just as much uh, a danger and even more danger of getting mental problems. Mm -hmm. People with high cholesterol levels don't suffer from dementia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the brain loves what? Fat. Cholesterol. Fat. Cholesterol. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I like this study because it wasn't funded by the pharmaceutical companies. It wasn't funded by the dairy industry, the meat industry, the, the wheat industry. So you don't hear much about that because they don't like the results. So they've lowered the levels. What else have they done to reduce heart disease? Uh, put everyone over the age of 50 on cholesterol-lowering medication. Has that helped? Uh, not at all. Not at all. So we have a book in our library called Lipitor, Thief of Memory. You see, what the cholesterol-lowering medications do, and this is Lipitor, Crestol, all your statin drugs, they block the pathway in the liver that the liver uses to make cholesterol. But that same pathway is the pathway that the liver uses to make coenzyme Q10. What's coenzyme Q10? That's your heart protective enzyme. So on cholesterol-lowering medication, you now lose your heart protective enzyme. So you can be more prone to a heart attack on cholesterol-lowering medication. So why is this book called Thief of Memory? The author is an astronaut and a medical doctor. And he, I think he was about 45. He went to have his yearly blood test. And they said, oh, your cholesterol levels are a little high. What were they? 220. Please go on Lipitor. Six weeks later, his wife found him out in the garden. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know who she was. So they stopped the medication and within about a week, he was perfectly fine again. Went back to the doctor a year later, had another blood test. Oh, cholesterol levels are still a bit too high. 220. I want you to go on that Lipitor. He said, I'm not going on that. I nearly went mad on that. So the doctor said, half dose. <laughs> Six weeks. And why did he do it? Fear. Six weeks later, his wife found him out in the garden, didn't know who she was, didn't know where he was, didn't know who he was. No, he stopped immediately. Do you know what the side effects of cholesterol-lowering medication are? Alzheimer's, dementia, memory loss. Muscle wasting. And they've just added another one, breast cancer. Mm. Where does the devil want to take town? Our mind. How many people in aged care facilities have memory loss and Alzheimer because of the cholesterol-lowering medication that they're on? Remember Revelation chapter 18, verse 23, the last part? 
Her merchants were the great men of the earth who deceived all nations by her pharmacia, her medications. Yeah. So is this one medication that you don't advise, advise caution with when you have guests to go slow to get off of it? Well, there is a side effect. If you stop the cholesterol lowering medication, your memory will return. <laughs> You can be on it for 10 years, stop it immediately, and you'll start to get, you'll start to get over it, yeah? There was a woman in Sweden, uh, maybe 10, 15 years, who received medicine, and she lost memory for those 10 good years. And I think she stopped yeah. using, and um, she regained her memory. That's right. We, we have seen that again and again. And she, she talked about the time she had lost with the... the oh, yes, yeah, that. yeah, that great deceiver, he, jeez. But why do people take it? For well, fear. So the only hope of better things is educating people in the right principles. Let the physicians teach the people the restorative power lies not in drugs, but in nature. And remember, if a drug doesn't have a side effect, it's not a drug. And so with all of this, surely that's lowered heart disease. Not at all. Not at all. We've, we're diagnosing in Australia 1,700 cases of dementia, Alzheimer's, every week. That great deceiver is taking down the minds of people. Mm -hmm. I've never had a cholesterol test. I don't even know what it is. I'm just not really interested to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my doctor keep from uh, nagging me about my cholesterol, and uh, three years back, uh, she said you need the medication. Uh, I think this medication is almost everyone in Sweden. Sweden statins. <laughs> That's right. The statins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, she gave me that. Uh, medicine, I didn't buy it, and then the next visit he asked me, she asked me, are you taking this medicine? I said no. <coughs> and then she, she did not question, <laughs> because she know me, we've been know each other for more than yeah. 10 years. But uh, she wrote the, in my journal that the patient doesn't want the medication. Yeah. Yeah, that is good. But you know, a lady told me yesterday that she refused the medication and her doctor called her a witch. Now, we should never go back to that doctor. And you know what else? Do not pay the bill. You see, it's, it's us who will change the system. And I met uh, an Adventist uh, specialist, heart specialist, and I uh, discussed it uh, with him. He, he's a Swede, and he practices in the uh, U.S. too. And uh, he said, send me your uh, <coughs> about this cholesterol. And I did it, and then he responded, and then he said, don't listen to your, uh, mm. to your doctor. Well, at some... I, I told my wife not to take the statins because uh, yeah. I said, she eats very little meat, sometimes chicken, sometimes fish. And it, it must be her natural values. Well, do you and then I, uh, we had listened to your... Uh, yeah. And, and you said, do you know yeah. what uh, yeah. Dr. Atkins found? Mm -hmm. What are his patients eating? Meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs. Mm -hmm. And their cholesterol levels are going down. This is something that shocked him because he's a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. See, it's not the food. It's the damage to the arterial walls that calls the liver to make more cholesterol to plug up the holes. So what causes heart disease, students? Damage to the arterial walls. We've got to put our magnifying glass and start reading the fine print on what we're washing our clothes with. Start to read the labels on the clothes that we buy. All of these little things, all of these little chemicals, like the dripping tap on a stone, come into our blood and little by little are eating away at our t arterial walls. Yeah? Many clothes uh, from uh, cotton have 
5% elastane. Yeah. Yes. Many clothes from cotton have 5% elastane. That does not bother me. Mm -hmm. Because if my stockings didn't have that, they'd be falling down around my ankles. <laughs> so it, a little bit doesn't bother me, as long as it is mostly natural fibre. Mm -hmm. Yes. But if Atkins didn't have the vegetables still, that diet with meat, dairy, cream and cheese, it would cause some damage to the arterial wall, right? Uh, maybe so, especially if it was uh, animals that, are, that have chemicals in them. Yeah. Because it's the chemicals. And it's he maybe the... was doing this diet before the worst of the chemicals in the, the sickness. That's, that's quite possible, that's quite possible. Yes, I do not advocate the, the Dr. Atkins diet. No. What interests me is his science, because his science is correct, which is the science that I have showed you today. But it is an interesting point that none of his patients died of heart disease. And yet if the saturated fats, the animal products were causing heart disease, then they would. But as Julia says, that it's the state of the cows. Remember the healthiest couple that came to our program were the meat, uh, organic uh, dairy producers? Do you know what they said to me? When our milk goes to the factories, they have to totally wash everything before the organic milk goes in. <laughs> and the, uh, I am not interested in drinking organic milk, <laughs> but it's just interesting to know why were this couple so healthy? because they ate all organic, they had no chemical fibres, they had no chemicals on their property, they had no chemicals in their home. And sometimes I think these chemicals are the hidden enemy that people aren't realising. We've been deceived. No. We've been greatly deceived. <laughs> no. And remember what I also said, they've got a big problem today in the, you know, the rubbish or the landfill that the chemical uh, fabrics aren't breaking down. It's 50 years later and they're not breaking down. Eh. And those poisons can go into the soil. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine is an organic herb grower and she went to the tip, we call it the tip, mm -hmm. is that what you call it? And she got some carpet to put in the rows to keep the weeds down between where she grows her herbs. And every year her soil is tested and they tested her soil that it had chemicals in it and she lost her organic status and it came out of the carpet. Ah. <laughs> so even carpets, that's, we have to be careful in every area, yeah? I have a question related to liver cleansing. So the process you have mentioned now so far is the liver will cleanse as part of a fasting process. That's right. But there are certain, at least two methods I know of, that focuses on just liver, liver cleansing without doing the fasting. Yes. Could you comment on, on doing liver cleansing without doing fasting? Well, most liver cleansing is done in conjunction with fasting, yeah. and it can be done without the fasting, but it is advised that most that we do. But there is one liver cleansing that's very well known and that's drinking the half a cup of lemon juice or grapefruit juice and half a cup of olive oil before going to bed at night. So what happens and why that does cleanse the gallbladder. It's really the gallbladder. So much oil comes in that the gallbladder goes almost into a crisis and spits out a huge amount of bile to cope with this huge amount of oil and in the process it's spitting out the stones. Basically that's the theory and it has been used for a couple of thousand years. So that's, that's one and it is also advised to have apple juice the week before to help break down the stones because of the malic acid in apples but all the modern apples don't have malic acid in them. So the only apples that would would, would give you the malic acid to help break the stones down would be from old trees. And if you buy an old orchard and you prune it heavily and manure it well or compost it well, in two years you can get some beautiful fruit. 
So that is one method. It's very important too that the next day that they that the person takes something for their bowels mm -hmm. to move and they know when the stones have come out because they can hear clunk, clunk in the toilet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course there's a word of caution often from the fasting authorities or the, you know, those that, that uh, suggest this, that if it's a large stone it could get caught in the bile duct mm -hmm. and that's can cause quite a lot of pain. But in the people I know that have done it, it, you know, they've done it quite successfully. And then some people gather it all, they gather their feces to check, and there are all these little green jelly type things. Do you know it's really just the combination of the olive oil and the bile produces those little green things, and they think they've lost a lot of stones, but actually they haven't. A stone is just like a bit of a stone out there. It's, it's exactly what it's described. In my book, Self Heal by Design, I do describe a gentler uh, livid or gall cleanse. And that goes over five days. And you don't necessarily have to be fasting. Maybe 2% of our guests uh, choose to do this. So we don't do it every program. And not everyone wants to do it, but it's over five days. And it's something like, um, I think, a tablespoon of olive oil, a tablespoon of... Um, and one of my books is here, and feel free to photocopy it out of the book. A uh, tablespoon of um, olive oil, a tablespoon of either lemon juice or grapefruit juice, and one, one clove of garlic, and that's blended and they take that in the morning. Second day, you double the dose. Third day, you triple the dose. Fourth day, it's double the original dose. And fifth day, it's the original dose. So can you see it builds up and then builds down. So it's a little gentler, a little gentler on the liver. Yeah? We could also have, uh, with a big gallstone, which is about three centimetres long and one centimetre thick. So with a big gallstone, what the person can do is wear castor oil compressors, and that's under the right rib, that's where you live. So you would, you would probably want to wear that for about three months at least before you consider doing the, the gall cleanse. What about the hot water flush? What's the hot water flush? Uh, I think it's called hot. It's also a, a kind of detox that you add a, a spoon of uh, salt in the lukewarm water and you drink it. Okay, so what, what that is, is that is the seawater flush. And there's one retreat that I worked at that used to do that. And you have two litres, one, <coughs> one third is pure seawater. One third is hot water and one third is plain water. And the guests are to drink that two litres in 10 minutes. And that can certainly get the colon going. We decided not to do that at our health retreat because too many times I saw people vomit it up. Sometimes I saw people not make the toilet, you know. Very uncomfortable and very embarrassing. Maybe for 80% of people, they, they seem to handle it. I think it's a little extreme, mm -hmm. though some people like it, but we, we don't use that. But it's no harm to do it? There's no harm. Okay. No. Yes? Just a comment to the uh, uh, apple and uh, grapefruit and olive oil liver cleanse that we were discussing. It's important to do an enema uh, at the end of it, um, I think, because you have to get rid of the poisons that are released from the liver and from the gallbladder. And if you don't do an enema, there's a risk that they will uh, remain in the body. Well, what, what they do at the retreat I used to attend, they would do the seawater and that releases it. We do our colon tea, we call it, and that releases it. So there are various ways that you can. And the retreat that I went to that, uh, that I attended for a while, who had the seawater, 
they've got 30 guests. It's, it's just impossible to give 30 guests an enema. <laughs> and some guests are not interested in having such a thing, especially a fine lady from a fine house in the city. <laughs> But they'll they'll eat the, they'll drink the mixtures. Yes. Uh, one other very interesting thing is that um, the liver is responsible for repairing a lot of parts in the body, uh, and uh, I, I connect that with uh, Gerson therapy uh, yeah. and and uh, the documentation of different diseases that have been taken care of uh, by this treatment. Um, That's true. Dr. Dr. Gerson had some amazing effects and he certainly did target the liver. The liver had to be supported. And some of the things I don't totally agree with Gerson, and one is that you had to take liver essence, <laughs> which was the liver from a cow. Also, today, with so many people uh, having problem with the high sugars, you had to have something like 13 glasses of carrot juice a day. And we find that if someone has got cancer, that just gets the sugar levels up too high. Mm -hmm. So Gerson certainly played a role at the time. I think Gerson was something like uh, late 1800s, is that right? I know his daughter, Charlotte Gerson, she's yeah. probably about 90 now. He died uh, 58, I think. Ah, 58, yeah. okay. So yep. Charlotte, Charlotte Gerson. Yeah. Just a few years ago. Yeah, okay. She was okay. 80 something. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She, had, she has already passed and she's allowed to at that age. So what was good that he did? Well, he was getting results. That is true, and he supported the liver, and he put people on on juice fast. What was interesting was he found that with his cancer patients, if they had sprouts, then they stopped repairing so quickly. And what he put it down to was that in the sprouts, and this is not Brussels sprouts; these are like bean sprouts. He found that in the sprouts, there was a little chemical in there that the plant releases to protect bugs from eating the new shoots from the sprout. But from what we know now, that there are many sprouts, especially the ones you buy, that can have mold in them. What's the name of the chemical? I can't tell you. Okay, yes. Okay. So one, one of the methods uh, Gerson is working with is coffee enema. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can you please comment on, on that can I method? Please? Because coffee is not good for drinking. But well, the good news okay is it's no good that way, but it's okay the other way. <laughs> Why? Why? Because when coffee goes into the colon, the portal vein picks it up immediately, takes it to, to the liver, and it causes a reaction in the liver to throw off waste. And so it, it works totally uh, different uh, the other way. And uh, Max Gerson, in his book, he gives a story about, I think it was in the First World War, there were big tents, makeshift hospitals, and they ha the nurses had to give enemas to a lot of the patients because the medication was constipating them so much and they'd run out of water. And one nurse said, look, we've got a lot of coffee left over. Let's just give them coffee enemas because they'd run out of water. So they gave coffee enemas to all the <laughs> patients. And as it, over the next hour, the patients all said to the staff, what have you done? Our pain levels have all reduced by 50%. So if I get someone who's got a very severe migraine and we can't, through all our hydrotherapy treatments, seem to bring relief, we'll give them a coffee enema and that, that will bring the pain levels right down. So there, there are examples of uh, very interesting results. Um, uh, it was one patient that had emphysemia, I think it's, uh, the name is, and uh, he had only 30% of lung, uh, um, what do you call it? Yeah, yeah, left. 
And so he went on the the this uh, therapy, and uh, after some month uh, treating himself at home, uh, he regained uh, thirty or forty percent of of lung capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was destroyed before, and the the doctor said that you will live one or maybe two year more, uh, and he could not understand how this no. could. It's, it is a miracle. It is a miracle for that to happen. That, that is certainly true because once the alveoli are dead in the, in the lungs, yeah, they cannot regrow. You, you would ask yourself, what is the liver really responsible of doing? Uh, can it repair a lot of more stuff that, than we know, know now? Or It's quite possible. Yeah, this absolutely. human body is an amazing piece of machinery. Yeah. Exactly. So students, look after your liver.